Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kelly Parker. I'm an eight-year breast cancer patient and going on three-year metastatic or stage four breast cancer patient. And today's webinar is brought to you by BrightBod. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for joining us again this evening. Um, just to start off with, I'm not a doctor, um, so don't take any of this information as medical advice. Um, but I consider myself a professional patient having uh, spent most of my adult life as a breast cancer patient. So uh, I really wanted to learn as much as I could about the disease and also share with others uh, as much as I can so they can, they can learn from my experience. Um, for those of you not watching this live, um, if you have a question, go ahead and log on to brightbod.com and record yourself asking a question. Um, then we will, either myself or somebody else at the BrightBod, will um, we'll review the question and then record ourselves answering the question so you have that interaction. So um, don't feel like if it's not, if you're not watching this live, you don't have the opportunity to ask questions that you may have um, as you watch the, the presentation. Um, I'll be doing the presentation about 20 minutes, maybe a little bit less. Um, so for that time period, I probably will be, I'll be muting your guys' phones or uh, microphones. Um, so we'll be able to, to participate during the presentation. But please write down the questions that you have um, as I go through the slide deck because I want to come back to them at the very end. We're going to do a Q&A at the end. The Q&A is my best, is my favorite part. Uh, this is when I get to interact with you guys, and, uh, and, and this is something that I really do enjoy. It's actually something I dedicated my life to um, as a, a patient advocate and somebody that, something that can uh, allow me to give back to the community that's given so much to me. So let's go ahead and get started. Share my screen real quick. Okay, can you guys see that? Thumbs up? Yeah? Okay, excellent. So today's topic is gonna to be uh, on the common myths about breast cancer. And breast cancer is a very, is a topic that's shrouded in a lot of bad information and myth, um, partly because it's a really big marketing opportunity. Um, so I, I, as I talk to people around the world, I encounter a lot of misinformation uh, that they heard, whether it's travel knowledge or something that they've read online. And I wanted to take a minute uh, to go through some of the top myths about breast cancer and what the reality is, so myth versus reality of breast cancer. Um, if you haven't already, please go and watch uh, Dr. Mesa's webinar on breast cancer. It's really good, a lot of great information on there, more from a medical perspective. Um, so I do encourage you to do that. Um, one of the main myths that I heard growing up um, is that you can't get breast cancer under 40. Um, this is bolstered by the fact that you can't get a mammogram in some cases unless you're 50 years old. So when I first found a lump in my breast at 26 years old, I wasn't worried about it um, because I always heard you can't get breast cancer in your 30s, 20s. Um, I've learned the reality of that since then, and it's, it's not a very pretty reality. Um, in fact, women under 40 uh, represent the leading cause of cancer death uh, breast cancer patients. So under 40, um, people aren't dying from lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, they're dying from breast cancer. And I think a lot of the reason is there's not, not a lot of information out there about people under 40 and the risk associated with, uh, with breast cancer. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for, um, to be diagnosed at a, at a later stage because mammograms are not a common uh, reality for people under 40 and most insurance companies won't pay for it. Um, I had to really fight to get a mammogram when I identified the lump in my breast. And uh, I know women that have been told a number of times, you're too young for breast cancer. What you have is a cyst. What you have is a fibroadenoma. Uh, what you have is benign. Come back, you know, in six months if it's not changed, we'll, you know, we'll consider something different. Um, so you really have to be your own advocate um, when you fall into a category of atypical uh, understanding about breast cancer. And, and these are doctors that... Um, that should know better that people can get breast cancer um, in their 20s and 30s. Um, I have encountered over the past couple of years, even metastatic patients uh, diagnosed in their teens. So th this, this is a really scary reality and, and actually a growing subset of patients um, dealing with breast cancer. Under 40 patients represent a, a 
a, a serious set, a set of complications when it comes to being diagnosed with breast cancer. So um, they tend to have uh, poor survival statistics. The cancers are, tend to be a lot more aggressive in young women because they, the cancers form from healthier cells. So whereas the progression risk for an older person, 40s and 50s, um, tends to be around 30%, some of the studies that I've read indicates that young women actually have a recurrence risk of about 40 to 50%. And nobody's talking about that. So that's something that's got to change. Um, poor prognosis is something that we, know we just kind of talked about. Um, when you're under 40, you have a lot, a lot more estrogen in your body. And estrogen has been associated with a higher risk of breast cancer. About 60% of breast cancers are what we call estrogen receptor positive. And that means that it's being fed uh, from estrogen in the body. So w without an um, without a interruption to that constant estrogen feed, uh, we find cancers developing earlier and earlier in life. Um, couple that with uh, an increase in the administration of birth control pills, uh, hormones in the food that we eat, and the, the milk and stuff that we drink, um, and, and we, we see those numbers continue to rise. So it's, it's not a common situation to have breast cancer in your 30s or 20s. Um, it's about one in 212 to get breast cancer um, in your 20s. I, I tend to fall into the rare category time and time again and not in a good way. Um, but I really want to encourage people that, you know, that feel like there's an issue, whether it's in teens, 20s or 30s, to really push, push for the mammogram, push for additional diagnostic testing, including a biopsy. Um, because that could be the difference of life or death. So uh, breast cancer can occur uh, under 40, not common, but it's something that we continue to see growing uh, because of the increase in estrogen and um, other mutational factors. Another common myth that we hear about is, unless you have family history, you can't have breast cancer. Um, and that's another reason I convinced myself that the lump in my breast was benign because my mom didn't have breast cancer. There was no family history whatsoever in, uh, in my family. So I, I let that give me reassurance when it really shouldn't have. The fact is only about 9% of breast cancers have anything to do with family history. And family history is, you know, a broad term for inheritance of several mutations that lead to an increased risk. Of breast cancer and if you have you know if you watch the news over the past couple of years you remember Angelina Jolie uh, who famously had a, a prophylactic double mastectomy uh, because she carried the BRCA2 mutation uh, her mother died of ovarian cancer that brought a lot of attention um, to mutations inherent in mutations uh, but not necessarily a lot, of, a lot of good information so not a common situation um, to have breast cancer as a result of family inheritance. Um, most breast cancer cases are actually caused by what we call acquired mutations. And acquired mutations are um, basically cell damage or DNA damage that occurs from um, environmental factors, from you know, the estrogen, free estrogen flow in our bodies. I mean, think about you know, young girls um, getting their periods much, much earlier nowadays. So that's a, a lot more active estrogen that's in our bodies for a lot longer than what our typical, um, typical duration of life is, right? Uh, the BRCA2 mutation is, BRCA1 and 2 mutations are associated with treatment resistant in cancers in the metastatic setting. So for the 10% or 9% of patients that do have uh, a BRCA1 or 2 uh, genetic cancer, they tend to be a little bit more aggressive and they tend to have poor prognosis as well. So, my best friend actually has uh, BRCA2 metastatic breast cancer. She's diagnosed stage four right out the gate. So um, you can get testing um, if you have strong family history, um, as in first line, second line, parent, grandparent, um, that could indicate the presence of a genetic mutation like BRCA1 or 2 or CHECK2, um, but the likelihood is, is certainly very, very low. The belief that you have to have family history to have breast cancer was really a, a poor understanding of how mutations are passed along and how mutations actually lead to the, the presence of cancer. So as we started to learn more about how mutations work and what that means from a uh, increased risk perspective, um, we have we've learned that 
it's not just about, hey, my mom had breast cancer, you might, you might get breast cancer too. It's really more about what mutations have I inherited from my mother or my father that, that may have uh, increased my risk. Um, the BRCA1 and 2 mutations, um, a normal person has a 1 in 8 chance of getting breast cancer over a lifetime. Um, BRCA1 and 2 mutation individuals have about four times that risk of getting an aggressive cancer in their lifetime. Um, it also increases the risk of skin cancer, um, e even breast cancer in males. Um, so ordinarily a male has about a 1% chance of getting breast cancer over his lifetime, whereas um, a male with the BRCA2 mutation actually has about a 6% chance. That doesn't seem very significant, but from a 1% to 6% chance, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty big jump and a pretty big risk factor when, when you know, breast cancer is pretty rare in males. Um, my best friend, like I said a minute ago, has a BRCA2 mutation and she has two children. So, you know, she has to, she has to wait until they're of age to consent to the testing. Um, it's kind of a, a wait and see game because, you know, she's living with metastatic breast cancer and probably won't live another 15 years for, you know, to get them there. So it's certainly an increased stress factor for her um, as, she, you know, as she watches and waits to see if they get any cancer that she might have passed along to. Something that I've heard and have used uh, incorrectly in the past when I was uh, naive to breast cancer um, is once you pass the five-year mark after treatment, uh, you are cancer-free. And we see celebrities and people online, you know, using the term cancer-free and, you know, they're, they're out there living their lives. The problem is there is not a test that's sensitive enough to, to recognize cancer at a nano level. So there's not a scan, there's not a blood test, there's not, there's not any sort of uh, testing that's gonna say there is a, uh, a cancer infiltration less than three millimeters in your body. Um, one million cancer cells can hide on the tip of a pin and three millimeters is, uh, is as most as it, it won't show up when I scan. So you're talking about three million cancer cells that may evade detection um, if you don't have um, evade detection if, you, if you're looking for on a scan or looking for a tumor marker test or a cancer antigen test uh, and what's called a liquid biopsy. So many of us that are walking around, you know, whether we're cancer patients or, you know, and not yet cancer patients that call themselves cancer free, really, really is a misnomer because we just don't know. Um, it's a very scary thing to say that, you know, that once you've had an invasive cancer, the only way you know that you're cured is when you die from something else. And I said, like, that's not a popular thing to talk about, but it's, it's really the truth. Um, we see um, cancers coming back after years of remission. We're talking, in some cases, 30 years of remission. Stage zero patients can and do metastasize. So... We always have to be vigilant um, as cancer patients to make sure that we uh, are bringing concerns to our oncologists um, if we believe that there is an issue. And, and for a breast cancer patient, that could mean I have back pain. It could indicate that there's uh, the presence of cancer in your bones. That's where my breast cancer is, uh, in my spine, um, in my hips, in my femur. Um, and actually, I went to the doctor because I had back pain, because I'd read online that um, their breast cancer likes to go to the bones. About 70% of people that develop metastatic breast cancer um, develop it in their bones over their treatment, um, treatment course. Um, if somebody develops a headache, that could be an indication that the cancer is back in the brain. Um, breast cancer is, is also famous for going to the brain. Um, stomach pain can indicate it's back in the liver. Uh, cough can indicate it's back in the lungs. So, um, really have to, to watch out once you have invasive cancer and, and make sure that any symptoms are brought quickly to, to a healthcare professional so, uh, so it can be checked out and have scans done. Um, increasingly, we're learning more about how breast cancer operates and how cancer operates in general. And we're finding that cancer can lie dormant, especially in the bone marrow, um, where it doesn't divide, it's going to escape treatment because if you think about how chemotherapy works, chemotherapy is going to go after indiscriminately 
the most quickly dividing cells in the body. So if a cancer cell has gone dormant and it's not quickly dividing, it's not quickly uh, replicating itself, it's not going to be targeted by that chemotherapy. That chemotherapy is only going to hit cells that are quickly dividing, your mouth cells, your hair follicles. You know, that's why your hair falls out when you have chemotherapy. Uh, some of your female cells as well. But they can lay undetected and, and not really hurting anybody or, or doing anything for years, and in some cases decades. And, and that is the belief of, of where a lot of metastases um, occur from is in treatment, is in, um, is in cancer that is, um, that is living in the bone marrow and just kind of chilling until something happens metabolically uh, to cause it to grow again, leading to metastatic tumors across the body. I um, mentioned this a minute ago, but breast cancer can and does metastasize 30 years later. So if you think about, you know, going through um, a double mastectomy and radiation and chemotherapy and believing, you know, quite convincingly that you are cancer free um, for, you know, three or four decades. And then, you know, you come to find out you have metastatic breast cancer. It's, uh, it's a pretty devastating reality. So uh, more and more, we're trying to push for uh, transforming a, what's now a terminal illness. Uh, I have terminal cancer um, into a chronic illness with a good quality of life. So if we can achieve that for, uh, we could actually help any cancer patient because you really take away the stigma of metastatic breast cancer and the death that will come as a result of it, typically in 33 months. Um, you can help everybody and really allay, um, allay that fear of the early stages feel and also provide some, um, some support for the folks like me who are living with metastatic breast cancer today. Um, Estrogen fed breast cancers, like my breast cancers, uh, are typically slower growing. So that also indicates um, how it was able to evade, evade treatment um, when I first received chemotherapy in 2009. Um, it's also associated with a, a later recurrence risk. So oftentimes with estrogen fed breast cancer, you may see a recurrence 10, 15, 20 years later. Um, again, just be vigilant and uh, make sure that any issues are checked out uh, by a medical oncologist. Well, this is a good one. <clears throat> I've heard this a number of times. Um, it, everybody has um, the big secret as to what's causing breast cancer. Uh, I've heard everything from deodorant and underwires and cell phones. Um, sugar causes breast cancer. Um, fake sugar, you know, sucralose, that causes breast cancer. Um, microwaves cause breast cancer. The truth is, there's not any real studies that link any of those things to breast cancer. Um, the primary cause of breast cancer, again, is that acquired mutation, generally with the free flow of estrogen um, before it's supposed to be happening. So while, while everybody wants to find that particular issue and blame something for it, uh, the fact is that there's not, there's not been associated any risk with underwire brawls or cell phones or... Um, or anything of that nature to increase the risk of developing breast cancer. And the last slide um, talks about having a positive attitude that'll help you beat breast cancer. Um, this is kind of my pet peeve. The, the general public likes to um, talk about, you know, stay strong, be positive. If you have a positive attitude, you're gonna beat breast cancer. Um, in reality, there, there's, there's no correlation between having a positive attitude and beating any illness. I mean, you don't tell somebody that has heart disease to be positive and they'll beat their heart disease and they won't have a heart attack. Um, or be positive and you'll, you know, uh, you'll get over diabetes or whatever. Um, this is largely due to cancer marketing. Um, they've, uh, they've made it a you know, pink boxing glove wearing sort of reality. And, and, and this has led to a lot of patient shaming, honestly. You know, I've, I've been told, well, if I, if I hadn't had a negative attitude, um, I wouldn't have developed a set of breast cancer. Um, I can promise you this. I have, I've had hundreds of friends um, that have died from a set of breast cancer, some of them the most positive people you will ever meet in your lifetime, and they still died. The disease does not care if you're positive, um, if you're happy-go-lucky, 
Um, it certainly won't hurt. Um, it's not going to hurt with your overall well-being. Um, it's going to it maybe make things a little bit easier on you uh, while you undergo treatment, but it's not going to cure breast cancer, and it's not going to prevent, prevent you from getting breast cancer either. So we just stop being so hard on ourselves and, uh, and stop, stop shaming each other when it comes to um, determining what the cause of it really is. So that's my short presentation. We're right on the mark with 20 minutes. Um, I'm gonna unmute your guys' microphone so you can start asking questions, okay? Uh, Kelly, mm -hmm. only breast cancer cells can lie dormant in uh, bone marrow, no other cancer? Any cancer cells can okay. lie dormant in the bone marrow. Um, Lung cancer is famous for it. Uh, pancreatic cancer as well, uh, that, although it's typically more of a viral -like cancer that's gonna spread right away. Um, most solid tumor uh, types of cancer uh, are capable of hiding out in the bone marrow and years for years being undetected. Um, there's some studies going on right now that's looking at what are called cancer stem cells. And cancer stem cells are kind of like the, the origin of the cancer. So even if you kill every single cancer cell in the body, treatment does not kill cancer stem cells. And if you can't kill cancer stem cells, you can't cure metastatic cancer. So there's some new studies going on right now that are actually looking at seeking out cancer stem cells and uh, targeting them for treatment and elimination. I think that has the greatest chance um, of being a better long-term treatment for metastatic cancer patients. Um, because it really seeks the source of what's causing that cancer to continue to come back again and again and again, despite being treated aggressively. Okay, thank you. Great question. Thanks, Lorna. So I know there are different stages of breast cancer, mm -hmm. but are there necessarily different types of breast cancer? That's a great question. Um, there are about 16 different types of breast cancer. And most people don't realize this. You know, they think breast cancer is breast cancer. <laughs> Not true. Um, the most common kind of breast cancer is what's called infiltrating ductal carcinoma, uh, which is found in the ducts of the breast. Um, about 80% of cancer patients, uh, breast cancer patients, uh, have are diagnosed with that type of breast cancer. That's my type of breast cancer as well. Um, about 6% of the breast cancers start in the lobules, um, so the area surrounding um, the milk ducts. Uh, it's a, a typically a stranger cancer. It's actually more akin to a gastric cancer. Um, and it's not going to show up on a scan in some cases because this does not present with a solid tumor. It presents with more web-like apparati. Um, and it's especially a danger from a, from a metastatic perspective because you might not see it until it's, it's, it's really too late. In some cases, the patients that I know have lived for weeks after diagnosis um, because lobular is pretty sneaky cancer. Um, we also have a pretty rare type of breast cancer that's called um, inflammatory breast cancer, and it spreads through the skin. So it's going to present itself as a red rash on the breast. Um, a warm rash is going to be kind of that orange peel texture that you've heard about. Um, again, no lump, so a mammogram won't even detect anything um, when it comes to uh, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, it is always diagnosed at stage three or four because it is already that advanced by the time, it's, by the time it presents with any sort of symptoms. Um, there's some breast cancers that, uh, that specifically apply to the nipple, um, known as Paget's disease. Uh, again, pretty rare, um, but within those subtypes, there's different things that are feeding those cancers. So we have some cancers that are fed by estrogen. Like I said earlier, 60% of breast cancers are fed by estrogen and progesterone. Um, we also have uh, some cancers that are fed by nothing, that, that they're known as triple negative breast cancers, um, which we haven't yet figured out what's actually driving them. Uh, it's just not estrogen, not progesterone, and not a human growth protein called HER2 neutral. And HER2 is, is a, a protein that's overexpressed in about 20% of breast cancers, making it an incredibly aggressive type of breast cancer. Um, there's new drugs that can treat that really successfully now. Um, but it w even within those 16 different types of breast cancers, 
every person's breast cancer is unique to that person's DNA. So whereas I might respond to a chemotherapy agent completely and have a great response to treatment, my best friend might respond to it, you know, in a completely different way or not respond to it at all. Um, in fact, uh, on paper, my best friend Lisa and I are identical. She has uh, ERPR, estrogen uh, progesterone receptor, metastatic breast cancer to bone. Um, I have the same, but she's had progression in the past two scans that she's had. Uh, it's now in her liver. And according to you know the pathology report, we should be responding identically. But because she has additional mutations, and, and I do not, I've been fortunate enough to respond over a 31 month period um, to the same medication. So not, not a simple disease and uh, not something people typically ask much about, but that's a great question. Anthony. How is it that the um, symptoms in men who have breast cancer, how is it different from uh, women? Example, lumps, do they get lumps? What kind of symptoms do they get? So it, is, it presents identically in men breast cancer, and we call it male breast cancer. I mean, really, it's just breast cancer. They, they fought for a while to call it pectoral cancer. The issue is that the stigma associated with a man, A, recognizing that they have a breast. Um, it's not something that men talk much about or even recognize that that's what's going on. Um, men have breast tissue. And if you have breast tissue, you are at risk for developing breast cancer. Um, men are not taught to do self-breast exams. Men are not taught to look for anything abnormal uh, in their lymph nodes. Men are not taught to talk, to, to, not taught to talk about this. Um, so there's still a really big stigma associated with male breast cancer. Um, I'm part of the Male Breast Cancer Coalition, not as a male, but as an advocate, as a supporter. Um, so I can educate people about the risk and say, listen, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, a faux pas to, you know, ask your doctor if you have uh, a, a new lump in a breast. In most cases, in a man is going to present um, as mastitis or, um, or in some cases, a, a benign fibroid adenoma. But in other cases, it can be cancer. So it's going to present in, in the exact same way. We're talking about a lump. Uh, men can develop lobular breast cancer, which is you know, not that lump, but it's going to you know, indicate uh, a drawn in nipple or an inverted nipple or discharge from the nipple. Um, men can also develop inflammatory breast cancer. So we have to do a better job um, as a country of educating our men to make sure, that, um, make sure that we help them understand when there's something wrong with their body. And I mean, I don't know about you guys, but my husband never goes to the doctor. He wouldn't, even if I begged him, even if his arm was falling off, he wouldn't go to the doctor. Um, so we have to make it okay for men to, to want to seek help if there, is, if there are issues. Most men that are diagnosed with breast cancer are diagnosed stage three or four because they wait and wait and wait, not realizing there's an issue or not wanting to go to the doctor. So we have, we have to get past that. Okay. Thank you. Great question. What is HER2 breast cancer? Was that a form of breast cancer you were talking about? Mm -hmm. What, what is two. it? So HER2 is a human growth protein, um, and it is found to be overexpressed in about 20% of breast cancers. Um, these breast cancers are incredibly aggressive. Um, they're very fast growing. I've known people to have a HER2 breast cancer that's gone from one centimeter, about this big, to about this big over a week time frame. That's, that's a terrifying cancer. Um, in 1998, the, there was a drug developed by Dr. Dennis Slamman um, who, um, who actually figured out a way to target that particular protein it's called Herceptin. And the trial was kind of the first of its kind. It, um, it actually started with metastatic breast cancer patients. Most trials today start with early stagers because the idea is you have to prevent breast cancer from becoming metastatic. Uh, the truth is, we're learning that you can't do that. Um, another really big myth of breast cancer is early detection saves lives. It doesn't, and this is gonna. This makes people angry. You know, it makes people scared because you know they thought they did everything right. Um, the fact is, uh, and I'm derailing a little bit here, Joe, but it's an important thing to talk about. Um, the fact is that those metastatic cells that we talked about earlier 
are traveling to distant parts in your body before that primary tumor is big enough to feel in your breast, big enough to see in your breast. So if you think about it, if the cancer has already traveled to distant places in your body before you can even detect a tumor, early detection is too late. This is why we see recurrence in about 30% of, of older people and about 50% of younger people. Um, HER2 cancers are more aggressive, but they also tend to respond better uh, when, when we're talking about drugs like Herceptin, Ticurb, um, Ketsila, and Pergetta, which are all targeted immunotherapy drugs um, to address the HER2 overexpression in those cancers. Nearly every 10-year metastatic person that I know, 10 year and beyond, and people that are 30 years metastatic, are HER2 positive patients because of that tremendous response that they got from Herceptin. So really it is a miracle drug for people that have a really aggressive cancer. They, they turn that, that HER2 overexpression into an Achilles heel. Just barely. A little bit. Let's give it a shot. I'm sorry, I can't I can't hear you. Is he muted? Okay. Let's try again. Can you hear me? I can. You can? Mm-hmm. Okay. You said that younger women have Okay, it, it, it keeps going mute, off mute, mute, off mute. Are you muting him, Joe? No? What is going on here? Okay, now we're off mute again. Let's try again, Green Acre 5. Okay. Um, you, you said at the beginning that younger women have lower survival rate. Mm hmm. What is that based on? Is it the fact that they won't live to be 65, maybe, or, 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 or what, what, is that, what is that involved? So younger women typically have more aggressive cancers. Um, it, it, they, these cancers are forming from healthier cells that lead to more robust cancers that are, that are um, more easily going uh, to survive past treatment. Um, it also, if you have a young woman that has 100% estrogen-fed cancer, um, you can take out her ovaries, and in most cases, that is the decision that's made for advanced breast cancer in young women. Um, but you cannot, you cannot completely cut off the estrogen flow from her pituitary gland, uh, from her thymus gland, um, and from the adipose tissue, fat, fat cells, basically, in her body. So the free flow of estrogen is, not, is something that uh, is going to increase the, uh, the mortality rate in young women. Um, and also we see the young women continue to get diagnosed a lot later as well, just like those men, um, because we're often not taken seriously, you know, you're too young for breast cancer, that kind of stuff. But the main reason is because the, um, so th there's also, you've heard of, you know, cancer, cancer stage, one, two, three, four, you know, zero is pre-cancer. But there's also another, um, another scale that we use for cancer, and that indicates cancer grade. So grade is from one to three, and grade one is going to be the lesser aggressive cancers, um, what we call um, well differentiated, meaning that it's, you can still tell that it's a breast cell looking at it under a microscope. Um, two is kind of middle of the road, and a three is the most aggressive and, uh, and what we call poorly differentiated from the primary breast cell that it formed from. Um, Almost every young person that I know, and I know thousands that have breast cancer, are grade three. And I believe it's because the, uh, the cancer cells are forming from healthier cells, and that tends to beget more, more aggressive and, and hardier cancers. So about that 50% recurrence rate, got to do something about that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly, I know we have heard that uh, a woman could possibly develop cancer if she has a history of it in her family. Does that go the same for men? It, it does. So if, if a man inherits the BRCA1 or 2 mutation or the CHECK2 mutation from um, a parent or grandparent, 
um, it is actually going to raise their breast cancer risk from about 1% over their lifetime to about 6%. And, and that's not really a significant increase, but when you think about, you know, 1% to, to 6%, 5% jump is, is pretty significant uh, over, over their lifetime. So uh, it, those mutations that are inherited are going to affect a man exactly the same way as they would affect a woman. Mm, okay. Thank you for your question. When people say to think positively, uh, do you, is it your impression that they're saying that because they really don't know what else to say? Or is it possible that when we think positively, some of the time at least, the chemistry in our bodies change? And uh, maybe the, the, chemical, the chemical change is an effective uh, way to combat some forms of cancer sometimes. Is there any possibility that that's true? I think anything's possible. Um, I tend to believe in evidence-based medicine. And, and whereas in, a, in a, uh, a medical study where you can demonstrate that a positive attitude by itself, you're going to have to exclude standard treatment from, uh, from the equation. Um, has a benefit in either preventing or or treating cancer. I've not seen it. And believe me, I've looked because I, I want to be able to provide this feedback to the people that I support. I support a group of about 5,000 metastatic breast cancer patients online. Um, I think positive attitude might help with some of the side effects. So if you think about some of the endorphins, it could be released with fatigue, um, sleeplessness, with, uh, with uh, lethargy. Um, stuff like that, um, I think that that certainly um, has a greater chance of, of really adding value there. Um, I've not seen the studies that, that have demonstrated positive attitudes um, helping either survive the disease or prevent recurrence down the road. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kelly, how long ago did you say you were diagnosed with breast cancer? So I was first diagnosed with breast cancer stage one uh, in 2009. Uh, I was 26 years old and um, developed a lump or found a lump that was quite painful. Another myth about breast cancer is that it doesn't hurt. This did. And I'm finding more and more that you know, people that have breast cancer are telling me that, that it, it hurt. Um, so I went in to see my, my breast surgeon. He told me, you're too young for breast cancer, come back later. I came back four months later and it had doubled in size. Um, at this point, he was willing to let me go and get an ultrasound to prove that it was a fibroid tumor, a benign condition that a lot of young women tend to develop in their 30s. Um, when I got the, uh, the ultrasound done, the ultrasound tech looked at me and I could tell she was uncomfortable. You know, I, I'm pretty good at reading people. Um, and uh, she said, we need a mammogram. And I'm like, I don't need a mammogram. I don't have, I'm too young for a mammogram, but this, this does not apply to me. Um, long story short, uh, it was breast cancer. Uh, they took it out. Um, and it was called a lumpectomy, basically, to remove the entire mass. Um, I had chemotherapy, uh, double mastectomy, um, radiation, and reconstruction. And I thought that no breasts meant no breast cancer. And I was wrong. Um, it came back around four years later in my armpit. So the auxiliary lymph nodes that drain uh, the breast lymph fluid, um, there was the tumor that was there was about three centimeters, about this big size of a small line. Um, so lots more surgery, um, more chemotherapy, and a lot more radiation um, to treat that recurrence. Still, that was considered stage three. So still technically curable, but typically it's the indication of widespread disease that you just can't yet see on a scan. Um, and about nine months later, um, some back pain led me back to my oncologist, and it revealed widespread metastasis to my bones. So pelvis, spine, hip. Um, I have been stable on standard medication to block the hormones uh, for going on three years. And that's not a typical response. That's... Um, Kind of a miracle response based on some people that I've met along the way and that have sadly passed away from breast cancer. So 
Um, this is not an atypical journey that I'm on. A lot of my friends are young patients and have had recurrence after recurrence eventually becoming metastatic. So um, once you have breast cancer, you always have to watch out for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we don't have any more questions. We'll go ahead and wrap up uh, for the evening. Again, thank you guys for participating today. Really appreciate you dialing in and asking questions. And again, for the folks that are not watching this live, go ahead and record your questions on brightpod.com and we'll be happy to log back in and answer your questions um, directly through, through another video. So have a great night and we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>